Good evening, everybody. Just waiting for you all to, to join, but welcome to this Just Reading Brooks Roan 2019 Vintage webinar. Delighted to have you all. Um, I can see you all jumping on now. We've got to 40, 50 people already. That's great. I think we're expecting 250 of you, which will be our biggest. So hopefully that shows that there's some interest in the Roan. Um, so the purpose of to this evening really was to highlight the, the great wines that you can, you can find in the Rhone Valley. I think it's really and unfairly a, a very underappreciated region. And um, I think that there are so many good wines, um, good wines there. I mean, the, the wealth of winemaking talent, young winemaking talent, um, making wines that are full of personality and full of, full of quality. I mean, it's, it's, there's a plethora of, of great bottles out there in the Rhone. So I think um, it's only fair that um, more attention should be given to it. And we'll be specifically looking at the 2019 vintage uh, this evening. And we'll be doing so through the lens of, uh, uh, of three um, producers from right across the valley. So you get a, a perspective from all over the Rhone and three producers who I believe are, are real flag bearers for their uh, specific regions. So we have um, Pierre Fab from Chateau Moradon and Chateau Neuf. Uh, we have uh, Daniel Rollet of Chenbleu in, uh, in Creste, um, and finally Pierre Rostang of Cote Roti. So um, I'd be delighted that they're all joining us um, and, and we'll be hearing from them shortly. So what we'll be doing is we'll be going through uh, domain by domain and uh, speaking to them individually, hearing about their, uh, their domains, how they go about making the wines and also their thoughts on the 2019 vintage, which is, um, has been released this week. Uh, exciting new release there to proving to be a very, very good vintage. And um, we'll be hearing from them. And as we go through, there'll be um, plenty of opportunity for you to ask questions. Please use the Q&A button uh, and I will be monitoring the questions and, and ensure that your questions are, are answered as, as we go through. Do also tell us about any, um, any bottles that you're drinking at the moment from, from any of these estates or any questions you have on, um, on the particular, um, uh, particular vintages from these estates you have in your cellar, when you want to drink them, et cetera. So we'll go through one by one and then at the end we'll join all together and uh, finish off any unanswered questions. So um, yeah, so that's how, how we'll run tonight. So I think without further ado, we'll, we'll go actually go to um, Pierre Fabre in, uh, in Chateauneuf, if we can, please. Um, and um, Pierre, Pierre is joining us from Chateau Morvedon in Chateauneuf. Uh, let me just um, spotlight you. There we go. So welcome, Pierre. Good evening. I'll have to unmute you, I think. There we are. Is my um, sound correct, Jais? Yeah, you're good. You're very good. So um, good, good evening. Good evening, Pierre. Good evening, Jais. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was great. Great to have you here. So um, for those that don't know Morandon, um, first of all, Chateau Morandon in chateauneuf du Pap. Uh, the vines there since the Roman times, I believe. And I think the first mention of the vineyard itself was in 1344. Um, but of course your ancestors, uh, Henri Plantin bought in 1923. Um, 100 hectares, now the, one of the biggest, or if not, I think the biggest, biggest estate in Chateauneuf de Pape. Um, can you tell us a bit about Chateau Morodon, its vineyards and uh, a little bit about its more recent, recent history? Of course, Jais. Uh, well, to, to give a short uh, presentation of Morodon, uh, I like to start uh, with the history of the estate because uh, it's almost a hundred years old vineyard now. I mean, uh, belonging to our family, even though the popes uh, in the past used to uh, cultivate the vineyards uh, on this site. Uh, but um, I think the history speaks by itself. So, uh, Morodon. Um, uh, was uh, bought by my great-grandfather uh, in 1923. By then, he was running a fertilizers company, so nothing to see with, with, with winemaking, but just agronomy. Uh, and he was passionate by wine, so he decided to purchase this piece of land, uh, which was far from uh, everything, and nobody wanted to buy. So he bought these 2.5 hectares of vineyard, uh, plus all the land around uh, that he could, and acquired uh, a contiguous piece of land of 186 hectares. And then he spent the rest of his life taking off the woods and planting the vineyards. 
uh, Generation 2 uh, went on with the job of planting vineyards, and so did Generation 3. So by the early 90s, we had reached uh, 100 hectares under vineyard uh, in the Chateau de population. Uh, without buying land, just by planting uh, the asset of my great grandfather. Um, just one thing is um, keep in mind that the AOC system has been created in 1936 uh, or launched in 1936, which means that uh, buying the land in 23 was quite an adventurous uh, and pioneering um, act uh, from my grandfather. Um, so uh, as the vineyard was extended. Uh, over the century. Um, sales also uh, developed. My grandfather was the very first to start exportations. By the early 60s, we were shipping about 60, uh, about, sorry, in the early 60s, we were shipping about 10 to 12 countries already. Uh, it was the, very, the real start of, of, of the export markets. Uh, and then generation three from the 70s to the year 2000, uh, developed and now we are uh, exported in about 60 countries in the world. Um, and actually my dad and uncle who, are, who were generation three took uh, retirement in July 17, uh, which is the time I, I took over the vineyard. So this is a brief uh, story of, uh, of the Chateauneuf du Pape Estate along this vineyard. In, uh, in 1980, we had the opportunity of uh, purchasing some land on Roquemore which is five kilometers away uh, by fly, fly bird from Chateauneuf du Pape. And it was a 15 ish uh, hectares of vineyard in Côte So starting in 1981, there's been a bottling from Montrodon in Côte Appellation. And in 1997, uh, the neighboring vineyard, still in Roquemore, uh, was on sale and it was in, in, under the Lirac Appellation. So start, starting uh, 1997, uh, it was the first bottling of uh, Red Lirac. Uh, so that's basically the, the 100 years of uh, briefly um, told of story of Montreal. Uh, we have developed in the past years uh, a little negos activity, so we are now uh, producing some gigandas also. Uh, and this summer we have acquired uh, Domaine de l'Oratoire Saint-Martin in Keran, uh, which is 25 hectares. Uh, so it keeps keeping us busy and with the head full of uh, project and new terroir to explore, which is uh, quite exciting. That sounds very exciting, Pierre. So I, should we just stop, pause, and have a quick look at where you are and uh, some of your vineyards? I've got a, uh, a photo and a map here. So um, here we go. So here's, here's Chateauneuf, Avignon down here, and between yes. Avignon and Orange. So, so Mont Morador's on the plateau here. And the north northwest of the Appalachian. Northwest of Appalachian, so that is that is Morado, uh, right yeah. there. And, um, and so if you go to the river, like maybe one one centimeter on your map, here exactly here is Iraq, Rocamore. And perhaps what people don't realize about Chateauneuf, uh, well, it's famous for the the stones, the Galley Roulé. So we we obviously have a therefore a shot of that. Uh, there's the estate. This um, is a great view of the estate, basically. Basically, the, the, the plane is uh, flying over the little round forest, which is Le Mont Rond, which gave the name to Mont Rodon. And uh, looking eastward, uh, we don't see it on the picture, but just after the picture is the Mont Rondou, very famous for Tour de France. So uh, on the bottom of the picture is the sandy slopes, and uh, behind the buildings is the Pebbly uh, Plateau. So here we have uh, some plateaus. So these, this is what people, I guess, think of as Chateauneuf du Pape Terroir, and this is where, you, well, it goes. It's a crucial part of your your Chateauneuf du Pape blend, obviously. About sixty percent of our vineyard is located in this terroir. Yeah, and then in addition to that, you make a selection, uh, which you started in two thousand and sixteen, of the very best plots, and you produce something called uh, Le Plateau, which is absolutely. Which is the, the, the concept behind Chateau Montrodon uh, is to take the best of the three terroirs, the pebbles, the chalk, and the sand. And the cuvée, the plateau, uh, is um, to just capture the best fruit of only one terroir, the pebbles, in the vintages that deserve it. So it's a super, super strict selection of one single terroir versus Chateau Montrodon, which is a blend of three terroirs. And speaking of, uh, we've 
we we know we know that obviously there is sand in the, in the Reyes and Grand Pierre and Pointu sectors and other parts of Jadnev, but there is also, as you say, kind of chalk and limestone. So here we have another vineyard. So tell us a bit about this vineyard, Pierre. Uh, this, this vineyard is is a very rocky, as you can see, but the, the stones are quite different. They are white and angular. They are not pebbles. Uh, it is the, the former mother rock. Uh, it's like it's old, old sea deposits uh, with the tectonic motions. Uh, it came uh, it came up. So it's there, there is very very little clay beneath uh, in between the in between the rocks. Uh, it's mostly rocks. That's why also you can see some wires for dripping irrigation in the warmest vintages. This terroir is uh, absolutely great uh, for white. It gives a very unique minerality, but it is uh, also very fitted to Syrah. Since there is a very good drainage, th there is a high hydric stress and it yields to very, very little uh, berries and their fruit uh, quite concentrated uh, fruit uh, almost every year. So can you give us an idea, just to, um, the different terroirs here in Chetanov, what, what are they giving to the wine? I mean, obviously, uh, you might have different varieties planted in different terroirs, but uh, overall, what is it giving to you? I mean, your Chateauneuf to Pat blend is a pretty classic blend. It's, it's obviously a lot of Grenache, uh, then some Syrah, about 20%, and then Mourag. But um, what are the terroirs giving to your, to your blend? Uh, on the pebbles, uh, I would call it a, a magical terroir because I would all, all the grapes do good. But uh, with the ones which perform the best is Grenache Noir and, and Morvel, but especially Grenache Noir. Um, this, it's doing also some good whites and some Syrah, but it's, I mean, it's an, an award for, for Grenache Noir. Uh, on the sand, uh, Syrah, uh, on our sand, uh, Syrah is the best fitted. Um, the, it, it brings uh, some more linear, pure, fruit forwarded Syrah, quite elegant that balances the, the power of the Syrah, either on the chalk or on the pebbles. Uh, and and the, the chalky part, the limestone, uh, as I, I said, it's, it's good to Syrah, super dark concentrated, almost uh, burnt character without, without any oak treatment. Uh, and also very, very elegant and um, um, fine mineral, uh, mineral uh, white wines. Well, I would say the best is on dust is limestone. I would, I would hesitate between, uh, I would say Grenache Blanc, yes. And I mean, you mentioned elegant there, so I, I know these things are relative, but I've always considered uh, Mor Morinon to be on the more elegant, uh, fresh, digest side of the Chateauneuf du Pape spectrum. And um, I mean, yeah. one, one of those things, is obviously you've got different terroirs to play with, which can help. Uh, you pick a little bit on the, on the fresher, more digest side rather than the super ripe side, I would say. Um, is that fair to say? Yeah, we yeah that's that's totally true. Um, we are used to picking uh, quite early by the appellation standards, so it gives a better uh, fruit freshness and also a better natural acidity. That's one thing, and and the other thing is um, we do moderate extraction uh, with not so long skin contacts. We we have all the cellars equipped with uh, punching downs, uh, so we could be rude to extraction if we want. Uh, but in fact, it's, we don't do long, long-term uh, skin contact periods. And, and in terms of aging, uh, again, not many, I think, are doing this actually in Chardonnay, but the um, half of the Chardonnay de Pape is actually aged in tank as well as in, in barrel. So um, that That's must That's for the Chateau blend, yes. Yeah, that must help the, preserve the freshness too. Uh, uh, that absolutely. There's about half of the of the the the, the, the grape, the, the wine, the blend, the final blend goes to oak, uh, which if it's it's new, one year old, two years old, and three years old, the Burgundy barrels. Uh, so it's kind of an oxidative um, aging, and the, the the portion that stays in tank has a total reductive uh, aging that uh, traps that captures the fruit. Uh, and blending both of it uh, brings this uh, complexity of toastiness due to oak aging, but also uh, the freshness of pure fruit. Um, so, uh, in terms of moving to the 2019 vintage specifically, um, love to hear your thoughts on, on that. So, t tell, tell me a bit about 2019. How, how good was it at Morodon? Uh Well, we'll see after aging, but it's Probably the best vintage uh, ever produced since uh, 61. 
Uh, it would compete maybe with 2010. We'll, we'll, we'll see with time. Uh, it, it's a very unique and particular vintage. Uh, uh, you want me to give more explanation about the weather in, in this vintage? Yeah, yeah, why not? That, that's, that's... Okay, so basically it started uh, the, the, the end of winter, beginning of spring was quite cool. So we were two weeks uh, ahead um, compared to usual. Uh, then in April and May it was quite chill, so we, we had some delay and the, the flower blooming was quite uh, late. Uh, it started end of May and almost finished a month later, which, which was very unusual. Uh, so two consequences of uh, this so long flowering and so late flowering. Uh, first is that there was some um, heterogeneity uh, in, uh, or disparity into the maturity uh, of the grapes uh, and also having the flowers uh, sensible to weather so long uh, it made uh, quite a big couleur, big uh, shadow. Uh, so uh, this couleur produced yielded to very little uh, yields. Uh, we were around 26 or ish uh, hectoliters an hectare in average. Uh, so uh, the fruit was quite concentrated. Then uh, there was a big, big, uh, and I forgot to mention that the winter was quite wet. It was about uh, uh, 450 millimeters of water. Uh, then uh, after the, 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 the flowering, um, we had a very, 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 very warm time, uh, almost uh, 46 or 47 Celsius, which is super, super warm. But at that time, the berries, uh, since the flowering was late, the berries were still green. So I bet it was more about photosynthesis of the berries also than cooking the berries or burning the berries. Uh, and then when the, after the region, it was still warm, but uh, warm as usual. So there's, as, a, as a conclusion, uh, there was uh, some cooler, uh, in, produced little yields, uh, and then uh, the scorching heat didn't affect that much the grapes, just evaporate some water or add it to the concentration, and then there was a normal, uh, a normal uh, summer. So uh, everything was there, uh, and this normal summer ripened the berries, kind of equalized the maturity in the berries, and uh, mostly uh, did not um, uh, prevent it, sorry, from any rot or botrytis or whatever. So it was absolutely perfect looking berries uh, at harvest time. So somehow it was quite a, an ideal vintage. Uh, and one of the key of the vintage, of course, is the low yields. Yeah, of course. Um, and no doubt helped by the, which we can talk about later, but uh, all of the improvements you've bought uh, brought to Morandon over the years since you've been uh, making the wine as well. But um, for now, we'll, we'll stop stop there and uh, move uh, north uh, west a little bit, east rather, up into uh, to Creste. So uh, we have Daniel uh, Rolle waiting for us, um, who's in Creste there, uh, in the middle of a very, well, a beautiful middle of nowhere sort of place, uh, Chêne Bleu. Um, so up in Creste, just, touching um, the northeast corner of, of Girondas. And um, well, the Chambler story, I think, started in 1994, where uh, Xavier and uh, Nicole Rolle bought this uh, dilapidated, abandoned estate and, um, and really set about reinvigorating it, I think, and um, brought it back to life. And in the process, uh, did so with great kind of care with the, to the local environment and, and then started making some wonderful um, wines in micro quantities, it has to be said. So, um, Danny, uh, welcome, and uh, yes, Chêne Bleu. So, what, what's so special about the location? Tell us about that. So, thank you so much for that, for that, Giles. And I think, you know, hit the nail on the head, location is absolutely key, as it is with any winery. But um, you're all very welcome to come and visit us one day. I will need to send you a map, so please get in touch. Um, because we really are completely isolated, sort of up in the, the hills coming down from the, from the Mont Ventoux. If you're coming from the sort of Plan de Dieu, um, and you see this little rocky outcrop of Gigondas. It's quite arresting the first time you see it. It looks a bit like the back of a stegosaurus. It's a bit sort of unexpected. And we're really um, perched up near the top of these rocky limestone outcrops. 
um, with quite a bit of altitude. So this vineyard you can see here, um, the reason I've, I mean, I chose this photo, you can't see the entire vineyard. I'll explain a little bit more about that in a moment, but I think it really gives you a sense of what it's like to be here. Um, you have this sort of rugged terrain, it's completely enveloped by the, the wilderness of this forest, which is actually a UNESCO biosphere reserve. So we're completely isolated from the, the sort of the rest of the world, which as you can imagine for viticulture is, is, is a dream, um, not having to worry about neighbors spray drift or anything like that. Um, but at the same time, we have quite a bit of altitude. So this here is about 550 meters above sea level, sort of clinging up towards the side of this, of this tectonic peak that was uh, made, you know, 200 million years ago. Um, and it's an absolutely wild piece of land. Um, Danny, that, that must make it one of the highest vineyards in the Southern Rhine, no? I mean, yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, we're, we're one of the, the highest vineyards for um, by quite quite some, some way um, in, in France. And to have these north facing slopes as well, to be able to grab back and to sort of take back that, that freshness into the wines um, that I think increasingly people are, are looking for with, you know, climate change and well, I guess we come, might come on to that later but I think all of these terroirs that are that are privileging um, sort of freshness are now really coming to the coming to the fore which is one of the reasons Ventoux at the moment is it's so exciting um, and you know we have to work it's part of the stewardship of the land is is working um, within within nature and making sure you know we work organically and we we are there to support the biodiversity that in turn helps um, help support the, the viticulture of the site. You know, the, the higher and the more pristine the environment, the more nature does the work to, to make the, the, the viticulture side of things um, much easier. It's much easier to, um, to, to sustain quality through difficult years if you're, if you're working in your, your environment. And I think this next, um, this next slide here really puts us into context quite nicely. So you get an idea of where we're sitting altitude wise. And of course that bigger diurnal temperature range, um, slower ripening of the grapes, viticulturally we're about you know, two to three weeks behind a lot of my, a lot of my friends in the area. And that is, is so special because it allows us to reach sort of without peaking over sugar maturity, we can let the the grapes ripen a little longer, wait for the phenolics to really be where we want them to be without sugar maturity, especially on grape cepage like Grenache, you know, just up, um, and while being able to keep the acidity in the grapes. So there's, there's sort of three confluence of factors, uh, the acidity, the, the sugar maturity and the phenolics can come together in the vineyard side. So that's the advantage, of course, of, of altitude. And I think what this um, sort of chart shows quite nicely as well is we have this really interesting sort of like a, a sort of time machine of mineral cocktails from the um, you know a lot of the the soils in the Ventoux uh, from the Mesozoic so uh, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous and rather than having all of these different time periods on top of each other horizontally. They've all been sort of thrust onto their side from this um, tectonic plate activity, and they just pop up in the middle of the vineyard. So from the last photo you could see, if you're standing at the top of that, of that vineyard, um, especially at this sort of time of year, you can see the, the soil change, this sort of kaleidoscope of color and, and different soil types across the vineyard. And we're really just nested in this protected saddle that feels like it's sort of a roof at the top of the world. And we have all of these different aspects, north facing, south facing, ranging across about a hundred meters um, different sort of altitude. And it's just such a, a magnificent toolkit to be able to realize this, this bizarrely sort of strange and isolated terroir that's on, you know, three appellations bordering onto a fourth appellation all at the same time. Um, so we have all of these different aspects, different soil types, and just the privilege of being as isolated as we are. Um, so that so really it, helps us. On, on that note, on, on the on the sort of the height, the altitude. So, um, does that one question from from Charles, um, Charles Bashby Taylor? Thank you. Uh, but does that um, does that help prevent against? Yeah, obviously that's it's cooler, and you get the diurnal shift. But um, 
how do you combat kind of sun, sunburn and is that a, is that an issue is that a question of canopy management it's a question of, of canopy management i mean a lot of we're lucky enough to be working with with old vines so our oldest part of our grenache and syra which which forms the backbone of our top two cuvier abelard and eloise um you know a lot of in the form two um we we don't really have uh um everything's on trellising because the, the belief was we wouldn't need the, the gobli to shade the berries. I mean, now we're just very, very careful and specific when it comes to canopy management. So we might sort of do a little bit of, of, of summer pruning in some of the, the dips between the hills, but for the most part, we actually uh, like to keep things fairly shaded. Uh, so it's just about attention to detail on each parcel, really. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people are finding the same thing. I'm sure the, the Pierres, as I will collectively perhaps refer to you, <laughs> will have found the same thing in their respective terroir. Uh, canopy management is key as it is in most areas. And in terms of uh, looking after the environment, I mean, you really do go, go um, very far in this. I mean, I think, you know, in terms of the ecosystem, it, it's even to, I think you have bamboo um, forests in terms of, you know, for water purification purposes and get, anything any little sort of snippet you can give us in terms of what you're doing at Chandler to preserve the kind of the yeah the the ecosystem um, well at, at the moment there's the most beautiful sound it, um, all of the the brebis we have a um sort of sheep grazing in the vineyard right now so they stay for quite a, a, a few months um and they sort of leave their droppings behind so it's in essence sort of fertilizer uh, dispenser um and my dad's uh, um obsessed with bees as he is with as he is with wine. So we're, we're growing our apiary at the moment and we're looking into, you know, in terms of how we manage covering crops, but also the estate. It's not only about managing the vineyard, it's about managing the land within which the vineyard is situated. So taking care of the forest, making sure the underbrush and, and the growth are cleared up, uh, but also making sure that when we have other plants um, sort of around the vineyard, if we do plant them, that they're bee friendly, that they encourage a, a healthy ecosystem. And um, we've been thinking quite a lot about what we plant around the apiary and where we situate the apiary in, in um, relation to the vineyard. Um, since uh, although vines are self-pollinating, pollinators also also contribute um, to the to the health of the crop. So it's it's an important part of the life cycle. Yes, of co of course, and. Um... I should, well, before moving on, I'll just point out that um, there is uh, Merendon Les Olivier. Thank you, Rosemary Brown. Uh, is 600 metres above sea level. That's nicely, nicely pointed out there where I don't, I don't know them. But, um, uh, and we also had another question for you, Danny. Uh, hello. Um, now I'm going to pronounce this incorrectly, but Noam Sajif. Um, I don't know if you, that rings a bell. Um, <laughs> but she's saying, hi, Danielle. Uh, long time no see. And... Um, are we really offering the 19? Yes, we're doing an on primaire offer of the 19. Um, one question that um, is being asked here is that, um, can you talk about the change from a touch of Viognier to a touch of Roussan in, in Eloise and how it impacts the style? So before we get to that, maybe we should talk about the fact that there is an Eloise and an Abelard. Um, so two, two flagship wines for you. Tell us a bit about Eloise and Abelard, please. So we, I mean, we have, as I said before, quite old vines. Um, the, we don't produce an enormous quantity of, of wine by any means, but the sort of heart and soul of what we do produce is, is based on the sort of the, um, the, the muscular um, sort of dark fruits of our Grenache, which forms the backbone of our Abelard cuvee. Um, and also the sort of um, silky purity of sort of mountain fruit of the Syrah, which forms the backbone of the Eloise Cuvier. And I think one of the things that we, you know, I'm, I'm second generation, so we've only really just started this. And uh, one of the brilliant parts about starting your own traditions, as it were, is that you can really, you can found your own traditions and, and, and find your own sense of place in terms of style. And we're unafraid to create these idiosyncrasies in the cellar. And one of the things we decided to do with our, with our Eloise cuvier, with the, the Syrah, was initially to blend with a little bit of, of Viognier, which of course has a, a, a precedence in, in the Northern Rhone. Um, you get this lovely sort of floral quality to it. It's a little more, more terpene than perhaps the Roussan. Um, and we made the change in 2011 and found that the Roussan, apart from, from being a, a, a blend that I think says more about the sense of place being as, as far south as we are, but as high up as we are at the same time, 
Um, it also just gives this lovely sort of richness and, and depth of, of um, sort of mouthfeel on the palate, um, as well as getting those floral aromatics that, that was sort of quite enjoyable to have in the blend from the, from the Viognier. So I think we've really now settled into our, our house style and that. And of course, they're, they're supporting factors for uh, allowing this this Syrah to really make itself known on the parrot on the palate and sort of having the the silkiness and the elegance and the, the restraint I'd say of, of our Syrah being as high up as we are. Um, so we work in the cellar for both Abelard and Eloise. Um, they're all all of the different plots um, are fermented separately um, and then treated separately and I work them separately in the cellar. Um, perhaps in very different ways on a year-to-year -year basis or from parcel to parcel um, and then we take care of them for you know up to two years in the cellar um, before we might decide to bottle then we'll hold back both of these bottles um, for both QV and then release them to the market only when we feel they're entering their drinking window. Um, so in, indeed uh, it, which is on you know uh, it'd be great if more could do obviously it's it's it's, it's difficult to do and, and to, to keep all those vintages back, but uh, great that you can do it and great that the, the Rhone has a champion um, who can release wines with a bit of age on them um, and, and show them um, when they're ready to drink. And of course, you have you have 30, you can do this, but you have 30 hectares uh, of vineyards in total, but certainly um, Avalon and Louise is just a, a microscopic uh, selection within those, those 30, 30 absolutely a few a few thousand sort of bottles mm -hmm. of each really which is why we can we can really put the philosophy of the domain to the slate release into those um, and I think it's important when you're a new winery and you need to establish yourself we needed those wines to be to be ready to drink um, and I think it you know going forward to the, the future I think that will help combat as well some of the, the, the problems with, with climate change. I think there's a, it's a, a different way of thinking that I think works in the, in the Southern Rhone's favour, this idea of, of ageing for a little bit longer before releasing. Indeed. Um, and actually we have someone drinking uh, Eloise 2011 as we speak. Um, oh, wonderful. Rosemary Brown again. So um, any snippets, obviously it was the first vintage that um, you started using Roussan and a tiny mouth, but and anything else to note of the, the 11 vintage that we should know about? Um, it was it was certainly one of the richer, more opulent vintages since we've started. I mean, our first vintage was 2006, and we're sort of releasing now, the, the 2012s were released this year. So we haven't had so many vintages in the market, but I would say it was one of the, the richest vintages um, to date, and in some ways has quite a few parallels. I know we're all here to sort of talk about the 2019, um, but I remember we worked on the Syrah for the 2011s fairly similarly as we did last year, um, which was really when we have a higher um, sort of phenolic potential on the Syrah is to really sort of coax out that potential um, a little differently than we than we do in in other years where we do have that richness. Syrah sometimes, if you if you extract too far, you can get those sort of herbaceous notes. You get a bit of reduction towards the end. And with this, we worked. I think last year we did about eight or nine della stage on on all of the tanks of um, and the, the sort of two tanks we had going of, of Eloise. Little tiny food, I should say. They're about sort of you know 15, 20 hectoliters each. So maybe tank is a is a big word for them. But um, the 2011, we worked very similarly um, with the Syrah um, as we did 2020. So there are a, quite a few parallels there. Um, and I think it's a wonderful expression of, of the richness of a site But we hope, I mean, I, I remember when I tasted it not so long ago, you still have this backbone of graceful acidity in there as well. And I think mm -hmm. it's just about teaching, sort of treating each vintage really as its own as its own wine from scratch and not having preconceptions about style and really being unafraid to express the vintage. Yeah, for, uh, fair enough. And, and when, when is this? Obviously, there's only a relatively recent history. I think first commercial vintage would have been 2000 and I want to say 2006, but I feel like I'm going to get that wrong. It's earlier than that. 2006. It was 2006. Yeah, okay. Um, so, yeah, any, we've got a question here from Nicholas Eldred. So, when, when do you? drink Eloise and Abelard. I mean, obviously within that kind of short 14 year time frame, but have you got a feeling for 
for when or is it literally just vintage by vintage um, vintage by vintage um you know cooler vintages like the the tens we'll, we'll see when the 13s come around um you know we waited quite a while before before we released them they were they were fairly closed um so we make I mean, one of the beauties of making sort of smaller amounts of, of these top wines and really selecting for quality and, and and giving them a more bijou treatment is that um you know we can afford to with these smaller quantities hold something back until we do feel it's open so there might be some some longer delays before vintages one day we might release a later vintage maybe even earlier than one that isn't ready um we'll see but we we want to be able to make these decisions based on um the wines themselves and and the, the quality level um because i think that's really what's going to to help express the terroir best and and sort of put on to uh, more into the, the forefront of, of what's possible in, in fine wine, which of course historically hasn't often been the, the case as a region. So let's take us then to uh, what 2019 means for Schembler. Um, just before we do a hello from Simon Field again. Hello, Simon. Um, yes, Uber de Billy would indeed approve of the, the bees. Um, <laughs> uh, so 2019, uh, yeah, how, how was it at Chambler? Tell us a bit about it. I mean, I, I've, I've been lucky enough to taste uh, the Syrup Eloise and the Grenache uh, for Abla. Um, just about the silkiest Eloise, well, in fact, the silkiest Eloise I've ever tried, I can, I can firmly say that, and uh, from a, an apparently hot, dry vintage. So uh, tell us, that's, it, that's intriguing. I, I, I think that's an interesting point because from a human perspective, I mean, Pierre's already very kindly talked about the general sort of weather patterns and there, of course, there are some, some differences here, but largely speaking, we experience the, the same. Um, but from a human standpoint, we have one little plot of Syrah we were, um, you know, we'd only had for a few months and that, that heat wave, I just remember being grilled out there in the vineyard trying to take care of this little plot. And so, of course, when I think back to the vintage, I think of my experience within that growing season. But when I'm thinking about the wines and what they were like in the cellar afterwards, I mean, the pHs were even a bit lower in 19 than they were in 18. Um, it took, you know, on, on the whole, we found that we had a greater number of berries and that the berry sizes were down sort of 25, 30% um, the weights, depending on the cepage, um, super concentrated. And there were periods during the spring, you know, when we'd have wind for 20 plus days. Um, so all this sort of transpiration, concentrating these berries down um, to, to these tiny sort of balls of, of complexity. And it was, I think in that respect, a lot of work in the vineyard for sort of relatively little juice in the winery, but really a pleasure to work with when it came in. So I remember we were out picking, my aunt was out picking for about four weeks. It was quite a long vintage for us given our size. Um, but then, you know, overall, I think we were down probably about 30% in, in terms of juice yield by the end of it. Um, and as I said, we could really work, um, when you have this high sort of potential um, phenolic extraction to work with, you can really just keep going and keep going. And, and as I said, rather than sort of more conservatively having to, 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 to coax out that complexity. Um, and you get this lovely, almost sort of licorice-y, silky, olive-y um, sort of magic that, that, that happens with Syrah in these, in these sort of slightly riper years. But I, when I think of the 2019, um, you know, for the Grenache as well, we had to leave it a little bit of extra hang time, which we can do when we're higher up. So I remember we had a break in the in the in the harvest for about two or three days just to let um, sugar maturity and the phenolics sort of get them to where they wanted to be. And the acidity didn't didn't really drop so much. Um, and I, I just remember it being incredibly concentrated. Uh, it's just a, a complete joy to work with, but without um, that sort of heaviness, as it were. And and at this early stage, that's a disclaimer, but um, for you there, I've put it in. But um, uh, where, where does it comp what does it compare to, and where, where does it rate in the uh, the, the pantheon of Chandler vintages so far? Gosh, um, and mm. uh, it's always difficult to tell at this early stage, of course, as well, because you're tasting 2019 sort of in barrique. Um, they need a little bit of time to gel, as I'm sure you, you, will, have, you will have seen when you taste it. But gosh, I'd put it up there with, uh, you know, 11, perhaps even the 
I mean, we were lucky our second vintage was 2007, which was so, you know, such a blockbuster vintage in the, in the Southern Rome. Um, I'd even put it up there, you know, by the, by the 2007 and 2020, too close to tell, but there are some, there are some similarities. Um, and as I've said, it's really, these last two years, I found we worked a little bit more similarly in the cellar than we have previously. Um, and I think we're really adapting how we work in the vineyard and the cellar on, it, on a yearly basis. Increasingly, it seems towards, towards this direction. So yeah, sevens and elevens, I'd say. Nice, well, I look forward to that. So um, a few years away from drink, being drinkable yet, but uh, um, thank you, Danny. We're gonna uh, pause there at Chen Bleu. And I think we're going to uh, jump on the road and uh, head on to up the uh, A7 towards Ampuy uh, in our virtual car. And let me just um, introduce you to Pierre Rostang. Here we go. Pierre, good evening. How are you? Good evening. Very good, well, thank you. Good to see you. Joining us from Ampuy uh, in the cellars there. So, um, so Domain René Rostang, yeah, was, was as for, for those that don't know, was set up in 1971 by René himself. It was tiny vineyard holdings then, really. But uh, I, I know that um, really the, the domain got to the kind of size, the seven hectares or so it has now in, uh, as of 89, uh, and uh, due to inheritance over between 89 and, and, and 1993. And, and they were vines that came in through uh, your father, uh, René, his... his uh, father-in-law, um, Albert Dovia, and also Marius Jontas, his uncle. Two absolute legends of Cote Roti, as anyone that is lucky enough to have bottles um, can testify to. But um, so seven hectares in Cote Roti, you, you joined in 2015, well, you, your first vintage, Pierre, was 2015, having worked with your father for a few years before. But um, tell us a bit about, first of all, about the, the estate, um, you know, where you are and what, what um, what your kind of philosophy is in terms of winemaking? Um, in terms of uh, winemaking, so the, our objective is always to try to express uh, the terroir, because in um, in Ampuy we have the chance to have a to have a, a great terroir we want to express. So the winemaking is quite simple, actually. Um, we say often that the, the work is in the vineyard, but it is real true, specifically in Cote Roti because of the uh, very difficult condition of work uh, with the slopes and, um, and all the terraces of the appellation. So the winemaking is traditional for the red, it's very traditional winemaking. It's, um, we like to use um, wall cluster, we, we do quite long maceration. We, we like to do we like to, to do the maceration sometime more than four weeks, uh, depend of the vintage, depend of the of the plots. Uh, we work with wild yeast, wild yeast. Um, and and then it's uh, cotroti needs about up to between 14 and 20 months of aging. And we um, we are careful to use not too much new new oak. Also, in the objective not to to hide the, the terroir of Cote Roti. So, um, what we our interest is to express the terroir and also the specificity of each vintage. So, so tell us a bit about um, whole bunch. So, what, what, why? So, you're pretty well. I think certainly for your single vineyards, you're pretty well a hundred percent whole bunch. Uh, and maybe just uh, tiny adjustments depending on the vintage or the vineyard. So what, what does whole bunch give uh, for the wines? What, what, why, do, why do you do that? First, what is interesting to, uh, to, to remind is in the past, there were no distemmer. So distemming is quite new, actually. It was only in the 70s that we tried to distem. In the past, of course, we, our ancestor could do it by hand, but most of, most of the time it was wall cluster for almost all, all of the all of the region. Um, then in the in the 1780s, uh, distemming was quite a, a trend, was quite a new tool. Many many domains wanted to to try to use for some appellation for some vineyard. It was indeed interesting because 
it it was it they were able to remove all the um, the stem that could bring some green green flavor and to rustic tannins. Um, but we think that uh, for Cotroti, um, we have the chance to have quite ripe uh, stem and removing the stem will be for us the equivalent to remove a part of the terroir. So we really try to, <clears throat> to add the maximum of the stem uh, that is possible. It still depends on the plots, it still depends on the, on the vintage. Um, but, like, but for 2019 vintage, as uh, many other recent vintage, the vintages are quite hot. So it's also very interesting, very important to keep uh, to keep those stems. So speaking of uh, speaking of terroir, um, let's have a look at um, some of your vineyards. Um, hold on, let's just stop that. Oops, I got the wrong. Here we go. Sounds like it's witching hour. <laughs> um, so here we are. So we've gone up the A7 from uh, from Creste down here uh, somewhere um, yeah. up to Ompuy here, and uh, so Ompuy just below uh, Lyon. Um, now, so this is uh, the Cote Blonde. So you no, make no. Cote Blonde, you make La Landon, uh, uh, Cote Brune, more recently as well. A bit of an homage to. Um, uh, to the famous um, uh, Cote Brun Cuvée of, of previous Marie years. Yeah. yeah, of Marie Jean Taz, indeed. So tell us, uh, so what, what's uh, Cote Blanc, for example, explain the terroir here and, um, and what it gives to the wine. What style of wine does it produce? So Cote Blanc is a lieu which is in very uh, center of Empuy. Uh, for us, it's a bit the heart of Cote Roti. It's, um, it's a lieu where the um, where the soil is very mineral, very poor. Uh, the, base, the base is still schist mica schist, as uh, for the other Lyodin Cotroti mainly. Um, but this, this mineral soil, this very, uh, this soil that can have also some limestone in it in some parts, um, gives in the wine some a very uh, floral wine more than the average and um, that's why this uh, this UD has been identified at the at special UD. This is the, the same shot so here's the, the house here looking uh, looking southwards um, so behind this picture so north from here would be the the Cote Brune so how, how does Cote Blonde and Cote Brune how does Cote Brune differ to Cote Blonde? Um, yeah so the Cote Brune indeed is very very close it's just the uh, it's just the, 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 the slope behind uh, in the north. Uh, first, the exposure is a bit different. Here in Côte Blonde, the exposure is south, southeast and um, Côte Brune is, is a bit more exposed uh, southwest. Um, and the, the second, uh, the difference is also is about the, the soil, which is still uh, schist, mica schist. Um, we can have a, a bit more, a bit more clay sometimes. It still have a, it, it is always, um, it is still very poor, very poor and not very deep soil. And for us, it's quite new because it's a, so it's a, it's, it's, it's a plot that Marie Jantaz was uh, growing. Um, but my father has to, as to replant in 1999, mm -hmm. so we we make a new cuvée of Côte Brune. First, it was in 2013, and so yeah, it's very it's very um, um, interesting how to test to test the difference of Côte Brune, which is very different to all the other Lyodi. And La Landon itself is also in the, in the Cote. Obviously, Cote Brune is a Lyodie as well as a wider area. 
Lalandon being in in the in the Cote Brune as well. How, so how how does Lalandon compare to to Cote Brune? Um, Lalandon is um, is uh, is is one of the slope that is east exposed, mm -hmm. and where you can find the the most uh, steepy uh, slopes. It's uh, sometimes it's about uh, it's almost uh, one hundred percent. Uh, we are, um, we are, for example, uh, this the last few days we are building walls in those um, in this lady, and it's the most impressive slopes maybe of Cotroti. Um, and the Lalandon are um, um, uh, are known to produce a bit more masculine wine. The tannins structure is um, is a bit more important um, uh, you can find also some uh, iron oxide mm -hmm. that make it a bit different to the other UD um, and um, it's uh, uh, you can you can find also this uh, I don't know the English name the the reglis, which uh, is licorice. the licorice Yeah. which is uh, one of the uh, uh, flavor you can find in Lalandon. In Lalandon. And then finally, obviously, you make a blend and podium, uh, of which uh, some of these vineyards will go into. And also, this is a, a shot yeah. of uh, uh, Tupin. Um, yeah. So, and podium will have a bit of Vieira in it, a bit of Tupin. Um, Br yes. Brune, if, if you're not making a Brune, it will go into the... Uh, into the Ampodium sometimes, so... The Ampodium, yeah. yeah. So the estate today is about uh, 11 hectares in Ampuy, uh, mainly in Cotroti. We have also one hectare in Condrieu and two hectares uh, for Vin de Pays, IGP Colline Rodanienne, with the cuvée uh, called uh, Les Lézardes. Uh, but for Cotroti, there are about 30 different plots spread out the appellation. And only for on podium it's it's more than 20 plots that are going to the blend so this picture is one of them it's, it's Tupin is one of the biggest plots going to on podium um, it's a, a bit a bit south to to Côte Blanc and you can you can see um, you can see all the all the dry stone walls uh, you need to to support the terraces and um, Uh, so it's a, it's yeah it's a, it's a, it's quite special because it's a, it's a almost one one hectare plot, uh, uh, and that my father planted 20 years ago now. Well, on on our podium we have someone who's uh, anonymous, uh, but uh, they're saying um, they have a they had a bought a case of 2013 on podium a few years ago. And were far too enthusiastic uh, in drinking it. They, they pretty well all drank it, but they have just two bottles left. When do you think uh, this wine should be at its peak, or should should they finish these two bottles, or is it worth waiting a um, a bit longer? Thirteen. It's. Uh, I would say it's possible to to, to open it now. Uh, yeah. It's a vintage I really like because it's a it's a very late vintage. Uh, harvest took place in the in, in October late September and uh, finish in October. Uh, it's a very fresh, it's quite cold vintage. And you you get this very, typic you, you get the typicity of Cote Roti. You get the spiciness, um, you get, you get the, the paper in the, in the nose. Um, and even today it's quite e expressive. So it's possible to open, to, to open it now. Yeah. Um, we have done. We have opened some recently, so I, I confirm it's it's possible. <laughs> And as the other Cote Roti, uh, it could it could age uh, at least five more years. Uh, we recommend to to drink on podium maybe after 10 10 years in average. Yep. Blanc La London, you can wait maybe five more years. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, maybe so to to answer the question. Let's let's say one one tonight and uh, the other in, uh, in <laughs> one three, in three <laughs> three or four years time. <laughs> um, and a, a question also on you mentioned the iron oxide on, on London. Thank you, uh, Nick. 
um, Constantine. So uh, the unoxo gives sort of what's really in terms of the profile of the wine. How does it change? You know, can you identify what kind of what it does to change the taste profile of the wine in, in La Landon? Um, Compared to the other Cotroti? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's also a, a UD where the, where the clay, the concentration of clay is a bit higher than the average. So in, in La Landon. In La Landon. Yeah. Uh, so when it is the case, usually the, the tannin structure is a bit more important. Um, and since it's a very well exposed uh, slope, uh, it's it's rich, but it's also very uh, rassé, uh, deep. And um, yeah, we, we used to say masculine wine. It's a yeah. kind of similar to, I mean, obviously Cote Blonde will be much poorer soil, um, but Cote Brune will be, uh, have a certain amount of clay in it as well. Um, yeah. Both of them more than, than, than Cote Blonde, I suspect. Yeah, the, the geology is very, and the pedology, uh, it's very uh, complex in Cote Roti. Uh, Cote Roti is the, is, is the end of the Massif Central. Uh, they have been influenced by over the last uh, four uh, ages, primary ages. Uh, so some places can, can have a uh, lot, uh, uh, lot of influences. Um, and so the way to to explain the terroir at the end is the it's the is the way the wine are expressing the, their flavor. So um, in, th there are twenty four century of history of wine in Cotroti, and so generation by generation they managed to isolate and to say, okay, these plots give this kind of this type of wine. And this is important to, this is interesting to keep it separate. Um, and so it's, uh, yeah, it, there are some guidelines for the geology, um, but it's, uh, uh, it's also very, very complex. And, and also I imagine that there's a difference because one, another question from, from Simon, um, but just around, uh, so we can talk about the 2019 vintage, but in, in, a, in a warmer, dry, drier year uh naturally i'm guessing uh the clay vineyards uh support the vines better the the more water retentive so lalandon for example or cote brune uh the impact in in years like 2019 is uh, is less or, or is it not as simple as that um it can be very heterogen um on the on the same plot, sometimes you have a um, twenty square meter where the where the soil is not very deep because you will have the the mother rock maybe just below, uh, and some other square uh, twenty square meter will get all the water coming from the from the slope, so um, it can be complex. But definitely the the, the last 19, like uh, 17 was very dry, 20 even more. Uh, we feel this, uh, this change and we try to, uh, it's, it makes suffer the divine for sure, especially because we also, we have uh, many old vineyards. We, we, we try to keep some, some vineyards that are more than 80 years old. So when those vineyards, um, get um, heat wave twice, like for example in 19, uh, they suffer a lot. Uh, so we try to keep a bit more leaves. Uh, when we do the replacements, we try to to bring more, um, a bit more uh, amendments to, to the soil. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, uh, that could be changing in this, uh, uh, in this uh, soil configuration. And for uh, 2019, uh, the wines themselves, just quickly, uh, style of the wines, uh, did, what, what are they like and, and what other vintages do they remind you of? 
So 19 was, um, um, so the maturity is quite high because in September, it was still a summer, summer time. Um, the harvest uh, was not so early because uh, as it was already said, April and May was cold, cold, uh, cold months. So the season was cold at the beginning. Um, but the summer was still uh, was still on in uh, mid September, so we have to harvest with quite hot uh, hot temperature. It was uh, 35 degree in the afternoon uh, while we were harvesting, um, and we also the degree was increasing quite uh, quite quickly, so we had to be very fast. Um, but the um, the crop was very healthy. Um, the maturity was here, of course, with that kind of uh, uh, climate. Um, and we had maybe a better balance with the, uh, we, we managed to keep quite good acidity mm -hmm. compared to 18, for example. Yep. Um, maybe thanks to the, um, to the water we got in summer, in August, sorry. In August, it was, uh, it was raining a lot compared to the uh, normal August months. And so the, the wine are quite rich, full-bodied, but the structure will be, it's, we, are, we are quite happy with the, with the, with the structure. Uh, the pH is, is, is good enough and um, it will be a vintage that could age. Uh, we'll need to wait a bit uh, like uh, the other hot vintages to to have it in the perfect uh, in the perfect uh, uh, time well I think we can we can all be a bit patient I'm sure for, for, for good wine good things come to those who wait um, so uh, a question good evening Margaret Margaret Rand um, a question there on uh, which I'll, I'll divert it back to you Pierre Fabre um, so uh, the skins and you can all answer this but the skins in 2019 were they were they thick? Was it was it a vintage of thick skins, you know? Given that these are kind of small berries, uh, just need to unmute you. Hold on. There we go. Okay. Um, so I I would say, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I would say yes, rather thick skins uh, for two reasons. Because uh, at first the, the berries were were small. Uh, so there was, I mean, a little juice and the ratio skins and, and, and juice uh, was, uh, was a big towards skins. And also there was a perfect sanitary conditions. Um, so the, the botrytis or did not affect the integrity of the skins. So yes, I would say quite, uh, quite thick skins. Great. And we've heard from Pierre a little bit about when to drink the wines and also uh, from Danny too. Uh, we haven't heard from you though, uh, Pierre Fabre, on this. So, for another question is, you know, actually, when when do we drink these wines? When should we be drinking Morodon? When what vintages are you drinking at the moment at home? Uh, let's say uh, I like to to bring home after each bottling the the very the very latest vintage bottle, uh, so that because I like to taste it in other conditions that at the winery and the home is a is a good is a good thing. So, but uh, uh, I would recommend, if possible, to drink the red Chateauneuf for six and or seven now. I think they are quite mature and they're showing great complexity. Um, and as far as the white Chateauneuf are concerned, I would uh, probably start to drinking the 17th or the 16th, like with the three, four years of bottle, matura uh, bottle maturation. Uh, it's uh, it's much more complexity and minerality. And once in a while, even if they are way too young, I like to pop up a plateau, just for my own pleasure. <laughs> I can understand why, it's a great wine. But um, Danny, actually same question to you then. Uh, what are you drinking at home, Chandler Wise? What vintage is, is the one for you at the moment? Gosh, I'd say that the tens and elevens really. Um, though the, the sevens are getting these wonderful sort of truffled notes, both on the Abelard and the Eloise, on the Grenache and the Syrah, but especially the, the Syrah. Um, so I'm just thinking sort of truffle season coming up. I'm, I'm planning 
um, a sort of a pairing there in the next few weeks coming up to Christmas. But um, in, in terms of sort of objective of wine style of the reds, um, certainly the 10s and 11s, which, you know, as vintages go, were so chalk and cheese next to each other. 10 was probably one of the coolest vintages we had had, at, you know, at that point of time, and then 11, one of the richest. So it's interesting to sort of see how they've both come into their own at around the same time. Um, and then for the for the whites, um, you know, 2015 Alio is, is, which is our Roussan Grenache Blanc blend, um, drinking beautifully with quite a few years of bottle age. And the rosé, I know it's maybe not the most fashionable thing to say, but we opened a bottle of sort of 2011, not so long ago. And it was oh. it was still really beautiful. Of course, you get a little, a little bit more sort of bottle variation, but the, the 16 and the 17 rosé um, are, are just delicious now and quite, quite sort of different. And I think a lovely pairing coming into winter. I'll have to look at that. I'm guilty of drinking them too young, but- um, Oh, I am. <laughs> <laughs> but I, mu I must try that. So, uh, and Pierre, the same question to you. So if, if you could choose one vintage to drink at home at the moment of Rostang wines, which, which would it be? I will go for uh, 07. 07. Which is quite ready now. Um, yeah. it was a, it's a very typical vintage. vintage. Typical aroma of Cotroti, quite fresh. And today the tertiary aroma are quite... Uh, ripe, ready. So on podium 07 is ready. We can even try some maybe uh, London 07 also. Um, mm. Yeah, that would be my uh, my vintage. For, for, yeah. Sounds delicious. And actually, coming back to, to Danny there, uh, we have someone who's drinking 16 rosé as we speak. Uh, so <laughs> that is si Simon Cartmel. Um, Cartmel, yeah. sorry for the pronunciation. Um, so there we go. Absolutely lovely, apparently. So, um, uh, and one final question. I think we've got to wrap up to over an hour. Um, it'll be too much fun here. So, uh, Andrew Jones has some 2004 Morador Magnums to hand. Will they keep a bit longer? Should the hand reach for the corkscrew, uh, Pierre? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think it's, it's perfectly mature now. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's, I mean, that's drinking beautifully. This is just uh soft and soft and soft this is um just some uh, spiciness some leisureliness so uh opening now it's it's perfect time uh waiting another five years no problem especially magnums but there's no real gain to hope from waiting so i would say yes now and that, that I mean, that's that's great and it's been a couple of years now it's been tasting very good so yes pop it for christmas Thank you. Uh, and a thank you to everybody. I've, as usual, overshot, but uh, it's been really interesting to hear from all of you. And um, uh, Pierre, Fab, Daniel Rollet, Pierre Rostang, thank you so much for taking the time and anyone for, for joining us. Oh, we have one more question. I mustn't. I, I know I has one more. Sorry. So, to those, uh, oh yeah, when did 2018 and uh, 2019 Abelard Eloise arrive? Well, they're still in barrel, uh, Noam. So, um, 19 won't be for, gosh, Danny, another, we're, we're just shipping the 2012 Eloise at the moment. So yeah. um, there's a bit of a wait there, I'm afraid. But you, we, you can buy it on Prima um, from the offer. So um, yeah, a, a few years yet, a few years yet. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and um, thank you also, Mark Wood, um, for joining us. I uh, hope to see you soon in the Rhone next, next time, actually in the cellars and not remotely, um, fingers crossed. Um, but a great uh, end of the year to you all and uh, thanks for joining us again. Thank you so much. See you guys. Bye bye. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir.